Our purpose here is to determine the lower limit for the energy required to account for the observed pulverization of the concrete fraction of the World Trade Tower's mass. After the impact of the aircraft, there remains a minimum of 105 undamaged concrete floors above street level. The only energy available to do any further damage to the building should be the potential energy stored in the elevated mass contained within the building's structure. This is estimated by FEMA to be roughly 4 times 10 to the 11th power joules. The towers were constructed with a central service core which was surrounded by tenant floor space. The floors in the tenant area were each roughly 31,500 square feet in area, 4 inches thick, and were described as being made of lightweight concrete. The floors in the central core space were each roughly 8,000 square feet in area, 5 inches thick, and were described as being made of normal concrete. Some of the mechanical properties of these two types of concrete are described in the National Institute of Standards and Technology reports. Here are the towers under construction. What follows are a sampling of news reports attesting to the virtually complete pulverization of the concrete fraction of the building's mass. But uh, Jackie Judd, our correspondent um, in Washington, has sent me an email just a short while ago, and she really speaks to what's been puzzling enormous numbers of us. We see all of this video and these live pictures of where the towers used to stand, but the question is, where is all the rubble? It seems so flattened. How could so much steel and concrete just vaporize? Did it all turn to dust? Engineers at the firm that built the building's best guess to account for the missing 1,200 feet of material from each tower is that large portions simply vaporized into the dust that rained down on New Yorkers immediately after the collapse. It was that powerful. We're talking here about 43,600 windows, 600,000 square feet of glass, 200,000 tons of structural steel, 5 million square feet of gypsum, 6 acres of marble, and 425,000 cubic yards of concrete, turned in good part into a cloud, says environmental medical doctor Stephen Levin. I was astonished at the degree to which solid materials were turned into pulverized dust as a consequence of that building collapse. I think it was striking. It's hard to understand where things were or where are they now. Can you tell us, can you point out what is what in this, this maze of, of rubble and destruction? This was the South Tower. This was 104, 106 stories tall. This is what is left. Up there was the North Tower. And you look and you see, and there's no concrete. There's very little concrete. All you see is aluminum and steel. What happened to the concrete? The concrete was pulverized. And I was down here Tuesday, and it was like you were on a foreign planet. All of lower Manhattan, not just this site, from river to river, there was dust powder two, three inches thick. The concrete was just uh, pulverized. Photographs of Ground Zero also attest to the total absence of concrete rubble. Here is the base of the North Tower. Here is the base of the South Tower. 
Photographer Joel Myrowitz was one of the only people to obtain high-resolution close-up images of the debris pile at Ground Zero. How he accomplished this is an interesting story in itself. This image is of the base of the South Tower and is from his book Aftermath. He describes a scene like this. Looking closely at what was left, I realized that there was no sign of concrete, which had been primarily used for flooring, except for the pall of dust over the rubble. The concrete had been pulverized by the pancaking of every story during the tower's ten-second plunge and expressed into the air in that gigantic cloud we all remember. The United States Geological Survey performed a limited analysis of the dust produced by the collapse. Samples were taken at various distances, up to just under one kilometer from the base of the towers. The fraction of pulverized concrete present averaged 21.2 percent and ranged from between 14 to 30.8 percent of sample volumes. Particle diameter was very consistent among the samples tested and averaged about 3 microns, with a range of roughly 0 0.3 to 30 microns. In the foreground of this clip is the pedestrian bridge at West Highway and Chambers Street. It's just under a half mile directly upwind of the North Tower. The amount and source of energy necessary to push this sharply differentiated wall of dust a half mile directly into a 10 to 15 mile per hour headwind could also present an interesting question. However, for our purposes, the bridge is used mainly as a point of reference to illustrate the quantity and distribution of the dust produced from the collapse of a single tower. No dust from the collapse of the South Tower has reached the bridge. Here is a clip shot at ground level shortly after the collapse of the North Tower. The camera approaches the bridge while traveling east along Chambers Street. Again, this is one half mile directly upwind of the collapse and represents the dust produced exclusively from the North Tower. Certainly, the larger percentage of the pulverized dust generated would have traveled downwind, so this should represent a minimum depth of dust deposited within a half-mile radius of the tower. Since 21 percent of the dust is likely pulverized concrete, clearly this is where the concrete floors went. Here the camera is approaching the same bridge from the north on West Highway. Our question again is, what is the minimum energy required to explain the conversion of the 105 intact concrete floors from each tower into the three micron diameter dust particles observed and described by the U.S. Geological Survey? We believe that providing a competent answer to this question is well within the capacity of any university-level materials science department.